Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Melissa Wilkinson from the education team at the Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Network. Good morning. I'm going to, I'd like to acknowledge the local custodians of the land in which we're meeting this morning and our elders past, present and emerging. Just a little bit of housekeeping. We will have some time for uh, questions later on. If you could pop those into the chat box, that would be amazing. If we don't get to all of them, um, send them through to education at hnecchn.com. .au and um, we will endeavour to get those back to you. Also a copy of the presentation will be up on the website. We are being recorded today um, in all our glory this morning and <laughs> you'll be able to watch that later through um, the education library on the PHN's website. So I'll hand over now to um, Marge. Good morning Marge and thank you for being with us this morning and she's just Hi. arrived back from a trip so we're glad to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's Mark. Do not call Mark, me Marge. Mark. <laughs> oh, my okay. kids call me Marge when they're, you know, a bit upset with me. Okay. Really? <laughs> Marge. Well, over to you. <laughs> Um, good morning, everybody. And I was just saying to Mel, oh, you know, like we've got four topics here, but can we just like deal with that in half an hour? And can we get onto the really meaty stuff, which is the stuff that's about now? Um, because I've got to make sure you've got some really good tips to keep you safe. Um, now, all I can tell you, we are in the middle of a global pandemic. What part of that do many parts of Australia not understand? <laughs> you know what I mean. That can even be you, right? It can be me. Um, it's been so lovely in Melbourne. I, um, you know, they've released uh, relaxed masks as of Friday but I returned yesterday afternoon I think I've just squeaked back from the Gold Coast where my mum lives and I tell you I don't think they've heard of COVID up there. I realise and perhaps you do too in New South Wales because you've had your brushes well and truly um, I have been seated at outdoor camp. Always choose outdoor, always. Remember about the safety things. Don't go out when you've got any symptoms. Always know what's going on in your household. And if that means dragging a 15-year-old out of their bedroom and saying, hey, you've got a bit of a cough there, what's going on? Because as healthcare workers, we don't want to put other people at risk. So that's about knowing about your bubble, you know, the people that you move with. And you probably are aware there's a few colds, plenty of gastro going on around Melbourne, which tells me people have, you know, dropped their guard on symptoms and mixing and kind of thought that we might be a little bit better than this. But on the Gold Coast, nope, they're right in your face talking to you. Oh, I reckon I can feel that spit right on me. And I'm actually not used to that. We haven't had that for a year in Victoria, people up close to you. and. It was a bit of a culture shock, I've got to tell you. So um, I said to my family up there, you know, I wear a mask when I go into my mum's doctor's, when I go into my mum's x-ray. I'm the only one in the waiting room. They have waiting rooms up there. Um, and mum goes, oh, you're so Victorian. I go, mum, I do this as a courtesy to the healthcare workers. The receptionists were not, no masks, but they had the sneeze shield. Well, okay. Um, the ultrasonographer, a mask. And I was in there with mum and I said, mum, I wear a mask because only one mask is about 40% protective to the other person. Both wearing masks, you're up around 60, 70, even 80% protective. That's why we wear masks now. This is how they wear masks in Queensland. It became mandatory as of yesterday. You, you know exactly what I'm going to do. But this is what you're going to see because uh, seven hours from Gosford to Byron Bay. It's all right, I did all my you know, Google distancing yesterday. So this is very popular. Very popular. This, plenty of that. Um, I even saw, okay. Just mask 101. I carry a little glad bag. We, you know, we always have to have a mask. Uh, please insist that patients who come into your uh, practices wear a mask. You should hear them. What? There's nothing here. 
Well, no, you can't see it, but it's called a precaution. See, they're all waiting for a case before they wear a mask. You and I, we are engaged in infection prevention and control. Don't forget IPC. So, nose tag has got to be fitted about halfway. They say about a third to halfway down the nose. You do not want a gap because what that means is you're breathing out. The actual primary function of the mask is to protect other people from you. See, we get it a bit around the wrong, oh, I'm here to protect myself from everybody else. Well, the primary intention in surgery is to protect others. So it's fitted. And what about at the airport? That's what I saw at the airport on the quarantine person, couldn't help myself. And so she's got a big gap at the side. What that means is that she's taking in and breathing out air, preferably from the side. And if you have just a big gap in here, the air, what you want is the air to go through the filter of the mask. Now, you will get some leakage because this is not a, you know, it's not a P2, but we're trying to minimise it. So to put them on, always do your hands first. Nose, so form that nice seal and straight. No, it's got to be nice and flat so that I am taking my breath. Now, this was her excuse. My glasses fog up. That's why she's wearing it below her nose. Well, lovey, you have not been taught how to do this properly, which is a bit freaky because they're our quarantine at, at the airport. So about halfway down the nose, form it. Now sit your glasses firmly on there, right? Firmly, no fogging up. Anyway, I didn't have time to explain all that as I put my bags through. I got as far as don't put the loops in. The only people who would twist it would be those with a very small face who just can't get a mask to fit. Now, of course, what's really good about wearing a mask, and you guys would be wearing a mask, is that it stops you touching your face, which is like an added bonus. Now, to take it off, it's both hands and it's away and down, and there's only one place for this at work, in the bin. So, if you haven't been wearing a mask at the clinic, I'm a little bit shocked, but hey, I'm only from Victoria. Um, but I tell you what, we have no appetite for risk. No appetite for risk. But also as a courtesy, like I, I feel like saying to those patients, don't you care about me? I'd be a bit antsy. So thinking about today, are you still saying to yourself, oh, it's up there at Byron, you know what they're like up there? Well, I'm sorry, but we are all connected. And if you think about those people in the eight yesterday, you look at how dynamic people are, how they get around, my God, how many takeaway joints, how much alcohol are people consuming? Ah. So I, I noticed nobody was at a museum or a library or an art gallery or even a swimming pool. Interesting, isn't it? But uh, we are a social species. I would expect people to be meeting and, and we tend to do that more over food than meeting at a gallery and stuff like that. But then, you know, I'm from Melbourne. So uh, re-engaging you because you might be in that, oh, that sweet spot. Oh, that's Byron. That's not us. So few of our healthcare workers in general practice are immunised. Now, I don't know what your figures are for today, but um, really, uh, the, the um, clinic staff in Victoria have just started, this is week two, I think, of the clinic staff being done. Um, and of course, please don't immunise everybody on the first, on the one day. I think you know why. It's called SE, side effects. So 20% can get a decent headache and aches here and stuff like that. So with aged care, the same too. They're sort of saying stagger your um, rollout. So if you've ended up with your nice little batch today of uh, immunite vaccine for your healthcare staff, think about staggering it. Maybe not uh, one day after the next, but I would stagger it maybe two or three days. So I do know that um, some of my clinic clients, um, they had a couple of staff off um, each day 
Okay, so um, and it was all and it was all gone. They said it was manageable, but they go, oh, I feel like crap, you know. So um, be upfront. I think it's about twenty two percent headache and and stuff like that. All right, um, pain at sight quite common, and it doesn't matter which vaccine, whether it's AstraZeneca or um, Pfizer, um, they're both you know having those. Now, is there anything good about the side effects? Well, apart from you know maybe half a day off for some people. Um, does it mean the vaccine's working? Well, it means you're getting a reaction, but it's not the start of your antibody production, but it, it, you know, it could be the tripping of it. So it really at about day 12, after that first shot, are the first measurable antibodies. Uh, not protective, because you need a lot more. Um, and the second dose, some people are saying the second dose has got a bigger kick in it. Now their report's not from here because we haven't had, um, we're just getting, I think, to second dose Pfizer, um, but I'm talking about overseas. So some are saying the second dose gives, has a bit more of a kick in it. Now what you're looking for are not just antibody production, uh, that's from the B cells. You know that our immune system, our specific immune system has the T cells and that's where the killer and helper and all of, all of those cells are coming from. Um, and your B cell response is antibody. So if you're getting an antibody response on day 12, you'll also be getting a T cell response. So just imagine, I'm having my vaccine this afternoon, always immunised on a Friday, so that the staff are, you know, at home on the weekend. <laughs> Very naughty. Um, so you can just imagine, okay, it might take me 24 hours and, you know, 36 hours and I'm right. And that is not everybody. Please don't get the impression that this is everybody. And don't be upset if you get it and your mate didn't or they didn't, you didn't. I mean, who wants, really, who wants side effects? But every vaccine has side effects. The flu, one to 10%. Nobody ever talks about it, but one to 10%. Um, in terms of why we're having the vaccine, we are positioned to have the vaccine at the best time. The best time is not while there are a massive number of cases. The best time is for us in Australia is now while we have few cases. So what they've done in Brisbane, that, that's mass vaccination I'm talking about. The best time is to do it between outbreaks. What they're doing in Brisbane is ring vaccination, which is protecting those who are most at risk. So you can see in Australia, we're actually doing a mix of both. We're doing a bit of ring and we're doing mass. What they're really doing in England is a more, you know, they're just there. You use the vaccine when you've got it, regardless of when your outbreak is. But what they've shown in both um, the UK and Israel is that in that two weeks after the vaccination, cases, I think in Israel, doubled. Why? Now, if you're a complete idiot, you might say, oh, the vaccine causes uh, COVID. No. It's a kill. It can't do that. It actually can't do that. It makes you produce antibodies and um, you know T cell protection against the spike protein. We've used. Um, I think one of the vaccines is whole virus, but it's killed. Um, but they're not the ones that we're using in Australia. So what happens is, oh, I've actually lost my train of thought there. Okay, um, jet lag. So with um, us, we're using the uh, the Pfizer, which is a messenger RNA vaccine. So this vaccine, as you know, and I'll come back to what I forgot in a minute, but um, this vaccine, minus 70, bit of a drag, but why is it kept so cold? Because this little uh, molecule, the messenger RNA, which is manufactured, it's, it's artificial. What uh, they've done here is they have inserted the code, the DNA code for the spike protein into a little fatty globule, polyethylene glycol, PEG, surrounds it. Why? Why have we put this molecule inside this fatty glob? And that's because this thing is just so reactive. It'll just be mopped up by everything if you didn't protect it or keep it at minus 70. So what they've done is they've kept it at minus 70 and I think they've got, well, you know how long you've got. I don't know whether it's an hour or so, but it, it's as soon as it's out of the minus 70, it's got to be, you know, thing out and put into your arm. And the polyethylene glycol then sticks to your cell and in goes the messenger, in, in goes the um, messenger RNA. And that um, directs your body to make some spike protein to which your body then makes antibodies and uh, protective T cells. So that's how the messenger RNA vaccine works. And there's about three weeks difference. So some of you might even be getting onto your second shot for that. 
The AstraZeneca, uh, what they've done there is develop the DNA that codes for the spike protein. So it's different. Okay, so the Pfizer is they're giving you the messenger RNA, but it's going to tell your body to make spike protein. With the AstraZeneca, they've got a what we call a vector virus. Okay, it's a chimp adenovirus. Now, don't make jokes. We've all seen the jokes about chimpanzee adenovirus and what that can do to humans. And I have to tell you, because you, people will ask you, oh, it's a live virus, they're giving me a live virus. Yes, this is the vector. So what they've done is they've put the DNA code for the spike protein for the coronavirus into the adenoviral DNA. It's a DNA virus, the adenovirus. But this adenovirus, it's chimp, it will not replicate in your cells. Its function is to come to your cell, you know, your um, immune cells, and uh, put the, um, or even other cells, it will actually put the virus into your cell. The virus can't replicate. But the little bit of DNA there makes your cell code for spike protein. So for the two vaccines, it's the same outcome. Your body produces spike protein and then your body produces antibodies to the spike protein. So that's all you really, I think, need to think about with the two vaccines we've got. Now, that's what we've got at present. And of course, you know, there's a 12 uh, week gap for the um, AstraZeneca, but you will begin to produce antibodies on about day 12, but they will just not be protective enough. You need heaps more. And that second dose is like a boost. So you get a prime and then you get a boost. Now it's evident, it's obvious that there will be more and more and more vaccines. So what you get next year, this is if we have to have an annual shot and most likely we will, because this is a virus that is impossible to, um, well, you know, the words eradicate and eliminate. So one refers, and I'll get this wrong, but one refers to getting rid of it within your locality where it's not replicating, and the other is more a worldwide thing. So we tend to sort of, you know, not use the right terminology, but get rid of, how about the word get rid of? Can we get rid of this worldwide? No. Why? Because it has an animal reservoir, an animal um it lives quite happily, not happily, but it can become endemic. We know that it's already done that. It's come from bats. And why did it get into people? Well, you don't have to be an absolute greenie to sort of work this out. But we're humans, and this has happened with Ebola, humans cutting down more jungle, humans having closer interaction with animals. Now, in China, that has always gone on always gone on. People have lived very close to their animals, rural, you know, large rural, whatever. The pandemics of history, such as um, the flu, always emerged in China. Nothing special, um, like it's not a, a race thing at all. It's about the way we cohabit. But we do know with um, further eradication of animal habitat, which brings animals in closer um, connection with humans, such as in Africa, Ebola. And you know that there's there's currently an, uh, an Ebola outbreak on in, in, in Africa, in West Africa present. So no surprise that it would start in China at all because of that um, close relationship. So what happens is, of course, the bat uh, coronavirus has been um, altering itself over the years. Most mutations are lethal to the organism, um, to, to the virus. They go nowhere. You know, it, it alters its amino acids around, no, nah, won't replicate, no good. So another clone starts to um, mutate a bit more, no, nah, no good, another clone. So eventually the law of averages is that you get a, uh, a virus that can jump into humans. Great, great, jumps and the human uh, can't pass it on. That is what happened with uh, the bird flu. So, yep. People got it, but they could not transmit it because there were you need more mutations to make it human to human. So over the years, what's probably happened is there's probably been sporadic cases of um, SARS-CoV-2, probably since SARS-CoV-1, and now it's changed again to be able to go human to human. So the virus is continually altering. You would just have to accept that. 
So no, we can't get rid of it because it has an animal reservoir. You have to knock off all the animals as well. So what are you going to do? Because it can be cats, not just um, pangolins and, and bats. So there are other species involved, and I'm sure you know that uh, they also immunise the gorillas in the, in the zoo, when I'm on the zoos in America, um, because it had been transmitted to the gorillas by humans. So this, this is really about the virus itself, and this is an evolutionary thing, and it's nothing new. We see this all the time. And diseases that we contract from animals are called the zoonoses or zoonoses, whatever you like to, you know, that word, whatever you like to call it. We call it, I call it zoonosis, and I've called it that for 45 years. Um, so you would have to, uh, with smallpox, how come we could eradicate, eliminate smallpox? Because it only had a human host, okay? But here we've got something that hangs around um, animals and has jumped. Um, the plague, uh, spread by rats and their fleas, et cetera, et cetera. You can't really uh, eliminate that because it lives in rats. We have cases of plague in Western USA, uh, parts of Europe, okay, ongoing endemic. And yes, you can give penicillin for plague. So don't get excited about, you know, plague. I'm a bit more concerned about our flu, <laughs> our flu um, this year. So I just wanted to explain the two vaccines. Uh, even if you don't understand the difference between a messenger RNA and a vector, a viral vector, remember that the viral vector, the AZ, it cannot grow. The virus, the adenovirus, the chimp adenovirus cannot grow in your body. It is non-replicable. So if anybody starts carrying on, uh, please put them right. So I've put some really good lectures up on my, not mine, but up on my website by some really fantastic people that explain that. Raina McIntyre, there's one on immunisation, uh, University of California, San Francisco. So they're like for Easter. Think about, you know, I, I need to actually know more because people are asking very sophisticated questions and they have the right to answers. And guess what they're getting off Facebook? You and I know that, all that rubbish that they're getting off. So even the mask, show your family, show your colleagues. I should never be seeing masks on a desk. That is like, that's what happened in some of the aged care places. They saw masks, masks on, de on desks in the pandemic. So this is just about people not doing it correctly. But you will hear people saying, and you've got to be that, you know, that Grinch, um, oh, we're okay here. We're down in Gosford. We're okay, okay here, we're at Inverell. Well, really, you asked the um, seven or eight people who tested positive yesterday, did they think that their results would be positive? Very few people will say, I reckon I've got it. Very few. It's a bit human, you know, a bit hard white. Oh, couldn't be me, couldn't be me, you know? Well, it is, okay, and it was. But put yourself in a precautionary uh, position. Precaution. What did I do today to protect other people? What did I do? Did we all hang around the tea room as though, you know, nothing's changed? Not great. Get that table outside and a few chairs. Start getting into your precautions. Um, why are we using the waiting room? I would hope that waiting rooms are really just for the next person seeing that doctor and just call them in. Five minutes, you know, if you can gauge when the doctor's halfway through the appointment. Yes, it means thinking and doing. Why have we got uh, two people at reception? Oh, well, one's got to take the phone. Well, why not give them a room of their own? Because if they've got to take the phone, they're going to be talking loud, droplets. So watch out that you don't get into that cycle of we're okay here. Aren't you being a bit over the top? It's called a precaution. So now I have one person at reception to receive people and take payment, hopefully contactless. <laughs> Couldn't believe the amount of cash I saw on the go. I don't think I've touched cash for a year. And that's just precautions. In fact, I think there are things that we'll do that we'll keep doing, like in your clinic, no toys, no magazines, no linen, no water fountain, you know, no water cooler. I love that. And clinics are saying, we're not even going to bring all that back. No way. No way. All we do is we give the doctors a tub of, you know, detergent wipes, no linen, and they just wipe the couch down after each, you know, after every patient. They wipe their stethoscope. Well, that's new, isn't it? So people are getting into, I think, some good practices. Hand hygiene. 
can't have enough alcohol. Um, but just a, just a caution, it's two-handed. Not this, not that you'll never get enough on. So no jewellery. As soon as I heard that case <laughs> from the Gold Coast, I was there, jewellery off. And bear below the elbows. A lot to be said for bear below the elbows. Just as good practice. Uh, no strong evidence that it's um, um, uh, you know, increasing transmission. Just means you can clean your arms if you sort of spray something on them. Bit of a push at present for that. So it's two hands. Obviously, I, I wash hands if it's toilet or food or my hands are uh, dirty. But here I am, a um, bit of a swimming pool. You've seen me do it. Nails short, no jewellery. Just got to make sure the alcohol can get everywhere. So if I've got long nails and jewellery, it just compromises hand hygiene. That's what you say to people. Look, they can wear all the jewellery they like, but their hand hygiene, I'm telling you, will be rubbish. All right. So you just ask them, do you want to do good hand hygiene or rubbish hand hygiene? So I dip my fingernails in, as you know. There are different techniques. Now you rub the alcohol, you spread it, sorry, spread it all over so your hands are glistening wet. Now you rub it into all those. And I do finger pad because finger pads are what touch things. Okay. Until sticky. Not just none of that, please. You've got to actually rub the alcohol in. So that you know, moves a bit of grease, moves a couple of layers of dead cells and start to affect the bacteria a little bit further down. So it's about 25 seconds before you can get your gloves on. Um, also, don't forget hand care. So Hand Hygiene Australia say you're not engaged with hand hygiene if you're not doing hand care two to four times a day. So put a decent amount on. Start your day. Start your day with this. It's a um, barrier cream. And so that will actually reduce the loss of oil and moisture. Okay. So two to four times a day. Um, don't put it at the sink. Nobody's got time to use it. Pop it in the tea room if you're using your tea. Look, you'll go into your tea room to grab a, a cuppa. Um, take it outside. Distancing. They haven't heard of distancing in Queensland. I'm telling you that. Even at Byron Bay, I watch them line up their testing, no masks and no distancing. Well, the rule is people finding it a bit hard. If you can't distance outside, wear a mask. They're all wearing masks inside in Queensland. I even had an argument with my brother who came to pick me up, not an argument, but they're just out of practice, to take me up to the airport. And I said, well, we've both got to put masks on. He goes, yeah, but you're my sister. <laughs> don't live with you. So then he got it. Then he got it. At the airport, there were people not wearing masks. Okay, so it's a precaution. So please think of yourselves as the educators of your family, of your staff, and of your patients. And just say, it's a precaution. Don't say, oh, the government told us. Don't say, oh, they're a bit obsessed around here. Don't say that. Um, say, we care about you. In fact, we care about each other. And we've learned a lot more about kindness, believe you me, um, in Melbourne especially. And it is to protect everybody. Do you feel like going up to people who wear it below their mouth? I just keep further away. And they say to me, why are you moving further away? And I go, because you're not wearing your mask. Oh, but I have, and then they go like that. And that's all I say. Um, you can be as rude, you can be rude, but you often don't get, um, don't get good results. So just going back to where do variants come from? I think I've explained that you certainly get mutations way back when the virus is going to try and jump around because it wants to transmit, it wants to spread itself as far as it can. The variants occur when you begin to get a pretty significant change to the spike. Well, we're interested in the spike protein. That's the one that we know we need anti antibodies to uh, that are protective. Okay, that's what we're after. You can get antibodies to a whole virus, but we're particularly after the uh, spike protein. So what happens is every time a virus passes, passaging, we used to call that in virology, 
every time the virus passes from one person to another, it leaves a little signature. And that's how they can do the genomic sequencing and link the cases. That's how they can link them all. But they know with this Queensland outbreak, the early one in March, they have missed, not they have missed, but the virus has got to, I think, more people than what we've been able to mop out, mop up. Now, is that a failing of contact tracing? No. Look, it's a bit like saying, oh, there's only, you know, 15 cases. Well, there aren't. It's just that those people chose to come forward. So you can imagine there are people sitting around in Brisbane who are thinking, gee, I had a bit of a sore throat, you know, two or three weeks ago, I thought oh, I couldn't be corona, so I didn't bother going to get a test. That is the problem. So we rely on people with the mildest of symptoms. I'm sure you've all heard your Premier and our Premier certainly say that. The mildest suspicion. We, don't, we hope it's negative. But that's the other thing you've got to really insist uh, that, that, that people do. Now, what they found out with general practice is, and this happened here at one of our uh, clinics in Melbourne, the person actually went to the doctor for an unrelated reason. I don't know, maybe they had their blood pressure taken or something like that. A day later, they began to get a sore throat. Now, they're a quarantine worker. So you know where it's likely that they've got it from. But what happened yesterday when at the doctor's clinic, they are infectious. So what were the staff at the clinic doing? You'll thank your lucky stars that if that's you, you all wore masks. You used your waiting room for the lowest amount of time. You stood back when you didn't need to be close to your patient. So the virus, to get this, it's time and distance. The more time I spend, closer. That's what you can control. So you examine your patient, you've got to be close up. You don't have to be close up all the time. Walk a patient back out to the car if you've got to have a uh, you know, confidential conversation, that kind of thing. Lots of doctors and, and nurses are doing that. I've even seen wound care done in a car and the old duck who, I'll say the old duck, that's terrible, um, who was having it done. This is fantastic service, all right? So the pandemic uh, planning tells us to develop alternative models of care and they don't just mean telehealth. So you can maybe do half of it in telehealth with one person oh, you've got to come in. Okay, but at least you've had some preliminary conversation. They come in and you might only need to have them close up for five, 10 minutes, which is a whole lot better than 30 minutes. So what are you doing to reduce risk? Have you been keeping this up? Of course it's tiring, but you know, this thing, I'm interested in this little critter going away. And my fear was that this year could be worse. Going back to Israel and England, why did numbers go up? There's a pretty simple reason. I've had the shot. I'm right. I'm, I'm clear. I'm great. I'm making antibodies. That's what happened. Okay. So watch out because there's more and more healthcare workers become immunised. People get slack. Now, we also don't know, and this is why you've still got to continue to wear your mask even when you're immunised, because the rest of the population is not immunised. Because we don't know that if the virus comes to you and you're immunised, it may begin to replicate a little bit in your throat. And of course, your body defences jump in and say, oi, stop that. But we don't know whether you could still be infectious to other people. So until the whole community um, is immunised, and that's what herd, you know, we want herd immunity. And we won't get it if only 30% of the population are immunised with an 80 to 95% immunisation. So it's about all of us acting collectively. But I, I put it to people, do you care about me? When they say, why have you got your mask on? I go, because I care about you. But I then want to say to them, do you care about me? So I think you can say it's cheeky, but it's actually true. So same with the immunisation. I'm having the immunisation to protect you. I care about you. There you go. Now, have we got any questions, Mel? Uh, yes, we've had a couple come through. So um, 
what what should someone do if they can't wash their hands or they don't have any access to sanitizer if they're in a situation where that occurs is there anything um that helps them in that situation well i'll be cheeky i don't know anybody who doesn't carry alcohol with them in the street but you know what i'm from melbourne so <laughs> yeah. um Give me a situation where that might occur. Do you mean somebody who's visiting nursing or? Yeah, I think so. I think that's what they're um, aiming for. All right. Can I give you some tips that I gave to some of the Aboriginal communities? Um, I said, remember face washes? Remember them? I remember little snap lock glad bags or even a plastic bag, but I like the snap lock or a thing like that. I said to the grannies, this is what I do as a granny, face yeah. washer, wet, and I pour um, even a bit of, I don't care whether it's dishwashing liquid or liquid soap or, um, you know, the stuff you get from hotels, just sure. a dog, yeah. fold it over into a square, put it into my little snap lock bag, something about kids choking on bigger plastic bags, a little snap lock sandwich bag, carry that in my handbag. Can't Gosh. get to a tap, can't get to water, wipe. Okay, then you have a separate one to wipe their mush when they've had their chocolate gelati. <laughs> Sounds great. So, very homemade, but it means I can wipe my hands with some things, um, you know, uh, soapy. And at least that moves, it doesn't get rid of everything, but it moves the bugs around a bit, you know, dilutes them out a bit if you like. Can't get near a tap, you're with little kids. But you know what? I've done that forever as as a grandmother. Um, you know, kids are like because I just think those wipes. We use enough disposable stuff, but I just you know carry those two bags. I actually had them. Um, I'll see if I can. Yeah, I have. I have got one here. There we go. Not that you have to take the shampoo out with you. But this, everybody, is a face washer. Wet it, yeah, damp, dob of shampoo in there, in there. There you go, in my, in my Versace handbag. <laughs> okay, that's um, nice. And, and, and just a, 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 um, a dish washing, a dish cloth for their mush, you know. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't um, you know. Whatever. Now, if you're completely OCD, you'd probably have a spare one to put the clean one in and a different one for the dirty. Sorry, you didn't get that far. Um, that's when I was, as I said, doing some work for the Aboriginal communities, and they go, yeah, we can do that. But I've done it um, all the time because I know people carry wipes with them and all that, but as I said, I'm just sort of trying to reduce the amount of rubbish uh, that we use. I lost my last one at the park. I left it on a park bench. So there you go. I've lost a face washer, everybody. But um, certainly stuff like that. Um, so sure. if, I hope that that helps that person. Uh, but you know what? My three-year-old grandson, he is all over alcohol hand rub. As soon as he sees it, he goes up to it and he does it correctly. Does it correctly. How's that, eh? Any other questions before I move on? Uh, yeah, the risk of infection when swimming in a swimming pool. Oh. Okay, um, remember the separation, fantastic. Don't, and the chlorine in the pool, fantastic. Um, my problem at the pool would be the cafe. <laughs> Don't cut. I know it sounds terrible, probably everybody who owns a pool in Australia will hate me forever, but I wouldn't even do a takeaway, sorry. Um, look, they were passing me, and this is about a cafe, um, no gloves, okay. Fine, I don't mind that. But the people serving the coffee, no masks. Now, that's Queensland, fine. They'll have masks on as of yesterday. But what happens is we touch our mouths six to eight times an hour. So on that coffee cup that she handed me and that the guy had prepared would have been both of their fingerprints. Am I obsessive compulsive? Not particularly, but you have to see the transmission. And I have to say, this is a little bit close to me because a, um, um, a really dear friend of ours, he's, um, he's an architect and his 2IC uh, is still off work uh, 10 months later, long haul COVID, 47, fit as, swam every day, 
severe depression now, but he has a swab done every month, he's still positive. Now we're pretty sure it's not replicating, but that's the gold standard for de detecting whether somebody, you know, for saying whether somebody's got it and he still has symptoms, still got a cough. So, you know, when, the, when you know about that, it's not um, common, but this has really wrecked this guy's life. He's had to live in the en suite and send his wife away and son when he wants to use the house, when he sort of needs to get out. So here are some of the things that wouldn't it be nice to just avoid wear a mask. Your mask, I know I was going to say that I forgot. Your mask has pretty well had it after a couple, I'm thinking about work here, not home. Home, we hang them up on the line, of course. But at um, work, oh, every two hours, I would ditch it. Once it gets wet, it's not as effective. This is what I wanted to show. And some of you have seen me do this. I committed a crime. I cut a mask up. And I wanted to show you how this works and why we wear it flat on our face. Um, so you've got, you know, the outer bit, always wear colour away from your face. So you can see the colour. So that'll catch the big bits. It's the middle bit that we're really interested in because this has actually got electrostatic charge on it. And so the particles will stick to it. See, so I've got a three layer mask here. Feels like sort of thick skin maybe skin for a graft. So um, this is where I want most of what I breathe in and breathe out coming through, all right? I don't want it slipping in and out the sides and I don't want it coming up over the nose. And then this is just the little bit, that they all act as a bit of a filter, but it's this middle bit that you know, gets everything to sort of stick to it. So if it gets moist, that filter is not as great. So I'd be a little bit shocked if staff were telling me that they're wearing one mask all day, because that says to me, you're not going to the toilet, you're not eating, you're not drinking, or worse, you're putting the mask down somewhere where it could be a contamination risk to others. So don't go back into that, oh, but we don't have any cases here, we just sort of do it for looks. Well, we don't, I don't, I don't. So precaution, looking after yourselves, okay? So the correct thing is, I'm going off to, um, I've got to change my mask, so I might as well toilet, drink of water. Um, it doesn't have to be a 10 minute break, but it's nice to get it off. So if it's a tea break, if you get a tea break, uh, do those things, change my mask, do my hands, uh, take my mask off, sorry, do my hands, toilet, do my hands, drink, do my hands. Certainly no drink bottles at my desk, please. You know what that's about? That's about touching back to my mouth and I've touched other things. Unless you're gonna do your hands every time you touch a drink bottle. Well, you know what? You're better off getting up, getting up and going out and actually moving. We know all that's important. So watching people's mental health through this, um, you know, there's been a real struggle, but um, your patient, I think, would rather wait in their car for five minutes longer knowing that you, each two hours are doing something to change physically your position and <clears throat> change your mask. I, as a patient, would not want somebody who's been in a mask for four hours. Sorry, not interested. Hopefully my, my, my mask will be more protective. So um, insist your patients, just remind them they're in a healthcare facility. I've been really upset at all of the um, instructions for mask wearing and Queensland was the same yesterday. It did not mention clinics or you know, x-ray places. It just said hospitals and aged care. I am livid. So if you've got a chance to get in the government's ear and say, would you mind saying healthcare facilities? Why aren't they saying that? Um, because we have really vulnerable people coming to our clinics. We know that. And those people do not need as many bugs to get sick. And if I've been immunised with, with, with it, and I'm, I think they've got like a four log reduction in the amount of virus that you pump out once you're immunised, but that could be enough for somebody who's really vulnerable and not immunised. Now, we know that that group should be being done by now, the 1A group and the 1B. I'll be really happy once 1B are immunised, a lot happier. Um, it means then that the youngies who do spread it, we know that, and that's just a social thing. Now that's not their fault, but they're very mobile. 
and they get very close and they're very social. So you would expect uh, there to be an increase. But I've got to say with the UK strain, the B117, which is what this is, is affecting the youngies. So um, there we go. Now, what other questions were there? Gone through masks, hands. And don't wear your eye shield instead of a mask. If you wear a mask and you want to wear an eye shield, it goes with it. But at this point, it's masks, all right? Wear oh, ventilation, windows open, doors open. Oh, we can't do that. We're air conditioned. Well, you know what? Don't use your waiting room or use it for the minimal amount of time because air conditioning, unless it's actually coming from outside, and many building owners can't even tell you that. So what we know about the um, aerosol, where the aerosols become a real problem, is where the accumulation of aerosols occurs, which is a closed building, closed room, a case in there, pushing out. They've got to take their mask off sometime for people to you know, check their throat and everything, or they're so crook and they're coughing that it's just going through their mask. Um, what we know is that that suspension of spit and snot in the tiny, tiny particles, the aerosols, hands, unless there's good air exchange. You don't want that. You don't want that at all. But that's exactly what happened with the guy using his nebulizer. We're you 99% know, sure that's what happened here in Melbourne. And of course, with the pressure in the hotel room, as soon as the poor old guard opens the door, is pushed out. So you know that we have more negative pressure in the hospitals, but we also have a better air exchange. So this is why the hospitals in the COVID ward are swinging over to P2 masks, because this is more effective. But you know, the real answer is, is to get fabulous ventilation in, but it's still not enough for them because some of those patients are so crooked, of course, the patients haven't got masks on, they're in, you know, ICU or whatever, pumping out virus. So this is a really high risk atmosphere. I really would not be recommending these for general practice. You see, when people go towards PPE as the main thing, they're missing the point. There's so much I can do to reduce risk. This is only a part of it, but this is not what I'd even be looking at in general practice. I'd be saying, how can I make sure that time and distance are just automatically taken into account in my clinic? As a good manager, that's what I'd be doing. And I'd be just having one person at reception and patients in, patients out. Now, some of my client clinics, what they've done is the doctors don't even see the patients in their rooms. They've converted their rooms with a bit of a coffee machine, I might add, and um, do their telehealth and make it very comfortable. And they see the patients in the treatment room, which has got a door to outside. So they actually, get, and the doctors are saying to me, I actually like going outside, chatting to the patient, blah, blah, blah. And so it's a different form of um, medicine. It's good, it's really good medicine, you know, a bit more barefoot. Um, but they go, oh, we just walk the patients back to the car. We want to have a bit of a quiet chat uh, to them. We don't have to wear our masks then and, you know, all's good. And um, what they've done is they've broken up their waiting room into three cubicles or two cubicles and they do the essentials, you know, with the curtains and um, do what needs to be done there door open. Who would have thought we'd ever have a door open in a treatment room? But it's about, you know, literally a triage of infection prevention control, what presents the less risk. And that's what you, that's how you look at your clinic. How can I reduce risk in this clinic? Because if you get a tap on the shoulder by the contact tracers and you've had a case in your clinic yesterday who turns out, you know, symptomatic and positive in 24 hours time, Close clinic, everybody tested quarantine. But if you guys have worn your masks, had minimal patients in there, you'll be just patting yourselves on the back because um, after a good discussion with the health department, you might find that you don't have to even worry, except you're a, a good clean, which you can do yourselves, not spend six and a half thousand dollars getting it done professionally. <sighs> anyway, I'll put something on my website there about um, how to do a deepish clean. But that's the difference. You know, you're running a business as well as attending really sick people and people have got to have a confidence. Now I would say to you, those of you who are insisting on, on masks, patients and staff, that's not a negative. They can be a bit, oh, they might as wear a mask. The next person talk to them and say, well, how good is that? They couldn't give a stuff at the clinic I'm at. So there's nothing negative about the mask. 
all right? It's a bit of a drag, etc., etc. but it's protective. And the more people wear it, you know, the better. Now, these masks, I'll simply show you what we call a fit check, not a fit test. That requires some pretty sophisticated machinery. Got to be done by a professional. Don't buy a machine. They're about $120,000. But this is what they're doing in the hospitals. So, nose bridge, very thick. What I'm going to do here is form the best seal I can. So very different to the surgical mask. So hands, do your hands, two bands, one on the crown, one below the ear. Come round to the front and then again, halfway down the nose, I form the bridge. And much actually easier to form a bridge there. Make sure I've got no hair stuck in here. Bit of a yawn. Now do some heavy breathing and it should collapse. And I should not feel any hot bits of air coming out here. You cannot wear a, you can't have a beard and wear a P2. Sorry, all bits are off. Now, this is called a fit check. I have found that this size mask, this type of mask, I can get a reasonable seal. But to do a fit test, they would, I'll put it crudely, put your head in a box, seal it pump some gas in, a nasty tasting gas, and if you can taste it, you haven't got a seal. And they would recheck, maybe give you a different size mask, maybe give you a different type of mask. It's not uncommon for people to fail this, but you've got to do a fit check first. If you don't do a fit check or you can't fit check, a fit test won't work. So that's your basic test. I would at least have a couple of these on hand in case you've got a dicey situation, but you need to know it's the fit test on top of it, which completes the picture. Having said that, it's pretty hard to get evidence that a fit test makes all the difference. It's just that it's gold standard, okay? Now, the only time I would wear this is if I'm in the COVID ward, okay? So, and no ventilation, but in the COVID ward. The only time I'd ever wear this in a general practice, and I hope it never occurs, is where I've got COVID patients, suspect COVID patients in the waiting room. Like, you know, full on. That's not our situation. All right, to take it off, grasp the bottom one, grasp the top one, and it's a way and down. In the bin, do hands. So fit check, is that's a bit I do. And you fit check with every mask, every time you put one on. Again, I hope you never have to do it. The fit test is just done once with that type of mask. But I tell you, some of the fit test failure rates are like 80%. So it's, it's all we've got. So hopefully that's given you a bit of a, a run around. Now, what have I missed out? The variance, that's right. I began to talk about how each time it passes from one person to another, we can actually tell where it came from. Are you up or down the line in a way, if you like? That's how they've worked out that we've got two different clusters. In New South Wales, in the northern beaches, they still have not established and may never. We have to accept that. Where did it? Oh, I came from quarantine. Yes, but we don't know the in-between people. And there was a real concern in New South Wales. I think we're okay now. I think you're okay now in New South Wales. But there was a real concern that there was another cluster circulating. Could we not find it? But people turn up for testing in massive droves. That testing is fantastic. So that's the time um, we are, there are two types of testing, as you know. We ask people to turn up with um, symptoms, and then we also do what we call surveillance testing. So we'll see what's going on in a community. I'll give you an example. Aged care, 25% get swabbed every week. That means over a month, all are swabbed. But it's not to see, it's not to sort of say, oh, you know, that's our check. It's actually to see what's going on in that community. Is there anything passing silently? In Queensland, it's possibly passed silently. Now, asymptomatic transmission. Do not tell me that all of those cases, none of them have symptoms. We know one person had symptoms. But about... I'd say 20% hard, hardcore, not a thing. But there's certainly half of people in total 
you would say, oh, is that what that was? It's sort of, I didn't really think it was much at all. So you, you know, this is this thing about, will I go and get a swab or not? Typical of viral transmission. So what they do then is they just go in for mass swabbing and they'll say, anybody at that venue all turn up for a swab. And sure enough, so today you'll get more cases. You'll probably start to get cases in Byron Bay. Um, the other thing about the UK strain, the incubation period is a couple of days shorter. So what happened here in Victoria when the UK strain got out um, a couple of months ago was uh, by the time the contact tracers called the close contacts already sick. This is a problem, big problem. But if you have a lockdown, you stop it moving. But you should hear people. But I've got something booked. What kind of a global pandemic are you not understanding? <laughs> Tell you. But a variant is a big change, a big mutation in the spike protein. So what passes person to person is just the slightest change, but it's, it leaves a little signature and it's enough for us to identify who got it from who or where it's come from. But the variant is a reasonable change to the point that we always worry that the vaccine may not be effective. This is our concern. But if it can't replicate, it can't mutate. So let's close it down. Okay, I think that's probably enough. I think that's enough. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mark. I um, really appreciate your time this morning and thank you everyone for joining us for this breakfast session. Um, just a reminder that today has been recorded and it will be available on our education library through our website in the PHN com.au and I'll also just mention that the survey will pop up um, at the end of the session it automatically pops up for you please I encourage you to strongly complete that we really value your feedback and um, we use those to plan ahead for further education events so once again thanks for your engagement thanks for the questions and th big thank you to Mark for being here especially after being away and, and arriving back last night so we really appreciate your time <laughs> stay safe um, everyone but you you are close to it yes yes true <laughs> um stay safe everybody and have a beautiful day thanks bye thanks Mel bye bye